So um, today the agenda, we're going to give a brief introduction to the InTech Centre uh, for those of you that don't know us already. Um, then I'm going to do the first section of the presentation, looking at an overview of flooding across Canada. Um, then moving on to more strategic action at the basin scale, since we are hosted by our watershed association. I think this is highly relevant. And then Cheryl is obviously going to produce, um, provide us with the um, advice on resident action at the home scale. That's the, the area of her expertise. So we're very complementary. So the Intech Centre is um, it's a res an applied research centre based at the University of Waterloo, but we really have a national focus. Um, uh, we were launched in 2015 um, with a gift from Intech Financial Corporation, but we, we operate totally separately from them, basically. So we, have, we are employees of the university. Uh, we also provide bilingual resources. So you'll see that my background says Santa Intact, which I didn't realize I hadn't changed. So, um, so we are very bilingual. I'm based in, in Montreal and uh, um, Cheryl is based in, um, in Ontario. So um, we have two main goals. One is to basically make sure that climate adaptation is part of the national conversation around climate change. Because particularly at the moment, we notice that um, many climate action plans uh, probably the, the reduction of, the, um, of greenhouse gas emissions takes up the vast majority of, of the actions around climate change, which is obviously very important, but we are beyond the, the, the time when reductions are going to avoid the impacts of climate change. So it's really important that in parallel, we prepare for those, um, for those impacts. And one of those impacts is increased in urban flooding. So, um, and that leads to our second goal, which is really to help residents, communities and businesses to reduce the risks associated with climate change and extreme weather impacts. Um, so this is part of, of that objective. Um, so we, we have a couple of slides for getting to know who we have in, in the virtual room. So I'd like you to go on your uh, website um, or your browser to www.menti.com and then type in this code because it's going to ask you for a meeting code. If you can type in that code, then you should see this screen. I'll give people a few minutes to get there. And what I'd like for you to do, basically, if, if you enter your responses, um, then a word cloud should appear magically <laughs> um, on the screen. And it's a, a way of just knowing who, we, who the audience is. And um, I have a couple of questions just to break the ice and uh, kind of get to know you a bit better. Great, one person has replied, so that's great. It's working, relief. <laughs> And I think we have uh, quite a few people who are residents as well in, in the surrounding areas, which is great also because um, people, it's people living in the watershed that we're also aiming to reach. So that's great. Oh, excellent. We have some youth as well. Very important for kind of continuing the work on this. So that's good. Local residents. Excellent. Oops, keep changing. Great, so I think we have a range of people. Um, we also have people from the city of Fredericton. Thank you for attending. Um, obviously people from the watershed associations and also from, um, from the conservation, uh, the Council of Conservation for Metro, uh, New Brunswick. So that's great. Great, I'm gonna move on to the next question. How does thinking about flood risk make you feel? But I think sometimes we, particularly as scientists, we kind of get very used to looking at maps and kind of uh, uh, houses on maps and, and, and how the mechanisms of flooding work. Um, but um, really the the social impacts and the health impacts and the mental health impacts of flooding are increasingly uh, important and will stress, yes. Exhausted. 
frustrated. Yeah, I think that's uh... okay. Great. Uh, unprepared. That's an interesting one. So hopefully this uh, this presentation will help you feel slightly more prepared. Helpless. Okay. Um, I get worried. Open to learning. Excellent. That sounds great. <laughs> great. Well, let's move on to the next question. Um, have one or you or one of your family friends experienced a flood at your home? So I think our experiences also um, kind of uh, dictate how, how we react to flood risk, whether we've felt flooding already. So the, the, the majority of people have already had some direct interaction with, with flooding itself. So that's um, useful to know. Right, I'm going to go back to the presentation now. Um, let's move on. So um, in terms of flooding in Canada, um, really it is the biggest natural disaster in terms of costs. Um, this graphic is, shows the insured cat catastrophic losses in Canada. And you can see that the estimated trend is at the moment going up. Um, and in 2020, um, we were at $2.4 billion in insured losses. Um, and the increase is largely due to water damage and extreme weather. Um, and we should note that this graph includes insured losses. So uninsured losses of governments and householders are estimated to be three to four times these costs. So you're looking at last year, maybe $10 billion. Um, and we look, we, uh, based on these, this, this kind of situation, there's an increase in the percentage of homes that are uninsurable or have a low cap limit. Um, so really, it, flooding is not an environmental issue, it's a very much an economic issue and a social issue. Um, so we have costs, the direct costs, but there's also um, kind of social costs in terms of health and safety, physical and mental health impacts on citizens. Um, direct costs include maintenance costs as well. Uh, indirect costs, lots of hours worked, insurance premiums increasing, and increasingly um, investors are taking an interest in flood risk and how we are managing it, because climate risk is one of the key risks to the financial sector as well going forward. Um, and then on top of that, we have environmental costs, disruption of the natural flood patterns and impacts on habitats and species. So costs are economic but there's also a, a number of other kind of triple bottom line costs that um, we need to take into account. Um, so the message is that on flood, floods are obviously a problem now, but we expect them to be more of a problem in the future because climate change is real and it's effectively irreversible according to um, the latest research. Um, I don't know whether you, any of you go on this website, but um, nowhere, and the, the link is at the bottom of this when you get the presentation. So nowhere in, in the US provide a, a monthly roundup really of the records of heat um, across the world. And 2020 was the, August, the hottest August ever in North America. And um, when you look at the statistics, nine of the 10 hottest years globally are in the last decade. And the tenth um, that's not including in that total was 98. So we can we really um, we're really seeing a warming of temperatures. Um, in terms of what that means for Canada, um, so Canada's climate has warmed and will warm further in the future, driven by human influence. Uh, both past and future warming in Canada is on average about double the magnitude of global warming and warming is effectively irreversible. Those are the conclusions of the federal government's Canada's Changing Climate Report. Um, so what that means in terms of climate impacts, we're expecting more extreme heat and less extreme cold, shorter seasonal coverage of snow, ice, melting of glaciers and rising sea level. 
And then particularly interesting for, for this topic is the intensification of extremes. So we're expecting increase in tense rainfall in urban flooding and coastal flooding in particular, um, as well as severity of heat waves and uh, risk of drought and forest fire. So um, flooding is definitely one of the kind of uh, the key ways that we need to adapt to accommodate these climate impacts. In terms of the Intech Center's role um, in and how we're trying to help um, accelerate the speed at which we adapt to climate risk, we've been working hard on developing guidance and national guidance and standards and kind of tools uh, for people to use to, to adapt to climate risk. We focused on flooding just because it is the top uh, natural risk in Canada. So you can see uh, a number of our reports here and um, there's a whole suite of them based on flooding. We're also looking at other risks, uh, forest fire and coastal erosion, and also the role of natural infrastructure and the financial market. So we have a whole suite of, um, of information, but we're, we're gonna be focusing on flooding and in particular, um, kind of uh, different scales of action, which brings me to this slide. Um, so at the moment, um, fl flood risk is a, is a kind of a complex um, problem to deal with because you really need to act at different scales. Um, so at the moment in Canada, we see quite a lot of action and responsibility um, at the, uh, the provincial level is responsible overall for flood risk management. Uh, but communities and um, cities often have uh, where the, the plans and the, the flood mapping and the actions come from at the moment. Um, and so we have a, quite a lot of tools and focus on communities, buildings and individual actions. Um, but what we're seeing emerging is more um, consideration of the river basin scale, for example, and also looking at in the investment framework and how the financial sector drives adaptation by investing in kind of a resilient solution. So I'm going to start at this um, more strategic scale and we're going to work down towards the individual scale. So in terms of a snapshot of flood risk management in Canada, um, as I said, the responsibility is with provincial government, but it's often delegated to local government or river basin authorities. Um, the federal government prov provides guidance um, and the, the action to adapt and uh, kind of uh, reduce flood risk is funded through different streams. So we can think um, particularly of the Federal Disaster Mitigation Adaptation Fund. Uh, which provided much funding for communities, uh, the National Disaster Mitigation Program. Um, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities also funds activities to help us adapt. And then the provinces themselves also fund quite a lot of work to reduce flood risk. And what we see as a result of these funding streams though is that there's largely is action at the community scale. So we have, uh, for example, in flood risk mapping, we have a, a patchy coverage of flood risk mapping, and it's mainly focused on river flooding and not so much on intense rainfall flooding. There are relatively few cities that have um, kind of publicly available intense rainfall um, vulnerability maps. Um, we also have site-specific flood protection um, using largely engineering approaches and limited kind of systems thinking at the river bas basin scale. Um, and what we see I mean, in green on this side is kind of where we're, we're seeing kind of movement towards looking at more strategic river basin scale. Uh, we can think of in Ontario, for example, the conservation authorities uh, operate at the river basin level and they regulate natural hazard lands, uh, which are basically lands which are at risk of flooding or erosion. Uh, we also see in Quebec um, at the moment movement towards a similar river basin scale um, and uh, inclusion of what, what is termed freedom space, which looks at flooding and erosion of rivers and basically um, limiting development in those areas. Um, and there's also the national adaptation strategy that was launched just recently. I'd say the other the trend is really looking to use the use of natural infrastructure. Uh, so basically how um, we can 
uh, reduce flood risk by using woodlands or uh, reconnecting wetlands kind of to slow water down, keep more water on the land rather than kind of draining it as rapidly as possible towards the river. Um, and really valuing those ecosystem services, which include kind of flood regulation. Um, so we're seeing more multidisciplinary approaches to um, engineers working with ecologists to design kind of uh, wetlands to protect areas downstream and also the importance of protecting the natural areas that we still have. Uh, so um, there's a, a trend towards natural asset management, which is basically treating nature or natural features as assets that need to be invested in and managed so that they continue to provide those services to the populations that are downstream of them. Um, and we also see a increased engagement of the private sector um, because they uh, are increasingly engaging in climate risk disclosures, um, which is basically how they identify um, and manage uh, physical climate risk, including flooding, um, but also um, looking to increase their um, environmental, social and government's performance, uh, because that's uh, kind of how, how they're being measured on that performance, basically, and look, investors looking to invest in natural capital as well, we're seeing um, that emerging. Uh, so basically starting to value nature as really uh, the resource that it is and not assuming that these services are free. Um, so just to explain a few of those emerging trends because people are in the basin so you're probably in, maybe interested. Um, so the river basin approach you can see this diagram shows some of the different um, measures that could be taken in, in catchment to reduce and to basically increase storage on the floodplain. Uh, upstream of developments, um, increased roughness, which means it basically slows down the speed at which the water moves, increased losses by encouraging the water to seep, seep into the ground through infiltration or by um, evapotranspiration from trees uh, or woodlands, and to also kind of the timing of peak flow some, in some catchments is critical to um, reducing flood risk, so that can, that can also help with that as well as reducing soil and river erosion. So it's basically working with natural processes um, that have often been pre-disturbed to um, achieve multiple benefits, uh, one of which can be reduction of flood risk. And we see a, this trend really uh, across the world. Um, the, the Room for the River project in the Netherlands um, is, I, I was learning about it back in 2000 and uh, we're still talking about it, but basically it was a huge large scale project and I have a slide just after to um, make more room for, for the river to take its natural course. Um, so basically in the Netherlands they've been actively moving back infrastructure to make more space for water. Um, making space for water was also the theme of the report from the UK in 2004. And the US um, also looking at nature-based solutions as they kind of now become called um, for community resilience. So we're seeing this trend to we, towards um, making room for natural processes and working with natural processes going forward. So this is just a, a, an example from the Room for the River project in the, the Netherlands. So you can see um, that's pretty major works basically to make more space on the floodplain for the river to take the space that um, the, the water would naturally take um, and, and reduce encroachment on the river floodplain. And you can see uh, various of the different methods that have been used. And if you're interested, I would recommend you go and check that out um, because it's quite a, a very interesting project and um, it's already been built um, so it's a very practical uh, demonstration too. Um, and in terms of what I was saying about the multidisciplinary approach, um, so um, our traditional approaches um, were are pretty uh, driven by engineering. Um, so we look at hydraulics and hydrology, for example, but um, we're increasingly working in multidisciplinary teams, um, including geomorphologists like myself, who basically look at the movement of sediment, erosion, deposition, and how rivers behave over time. 
uh, and then linking that through to water quality and ecology and ecosystems so that we have this holistic solution rather than just dealing with the physical processes. So um, I wanted to just bring it back. That's a kind of an overview on emerging trends. I wanted to bring it back now to New Brunswick. So I think in, in New Brunswick, I've called it the triple whammy because uh, I think um, you know there's several issues to deal with in New Brunswick um, in terms of different types of flooding. So obviously riverine flooding is probably top of everyone's mind. The St. John's River had several uh, recent floods and there's 60,000 kilometers of river in the province. Obviously the Neshwak watershed where we, we are now virtually, um, uh, there's several flooding hotspots and you can see um, the graphic is basically the flood envelope map that I um, pulled off the, the province's um, GONB portal. Um, and also ice jams are particularly problematic. So um, I think riverine flooding is a key focus, obviously. I was interested in the comment in, in the statement of the watershed that the removal of forests along the lower floodplain of, of the Neshwak has greatly increased the river's ability to tr control the amount and timing of floodwaters and floods, because this kind of feeds back into that river basin approach that I was talking about previously. So I think that's very interesting and uh, something that I will come back to. Um, and then obviously the coast is there. The coastal flooding is also going to be an issue and everywhere intense rainfall flooding in urban areas is expected to increase with climate change. So that's uh, another type of flooding that it's New Brunswick will have to adapt to. Um, flood preparedness in cities. Uh, some of you might have seen a latest report that um, was launched last week, um, which focused on 16 large, uh, um, large Canadian cities across the country and their level of preparedness uh, for flood risk, uh, looking at seven different categories of preparedness from mapping and land use planning to urban drainage, um, residential property, critical infrastructure, public health and emergency management. And um, Fredericton, and I know we've got people in the room from Fredericton. Um, so Fredericton scored pretty well in this survey. Um, the average survey um, result was C plus, um, which shows that we haven't uh, overall, um, cities have not made a, a great progress in flood preparation since, uh, since the last study was in 2015. So the overall message of the study is that we are moving, progressing, but we're not, we haven't got the urgency that we need to progress more rapidly. And we would like everyone to get an A really in the next four years. Um, but Fredericton got a B minus and was so performed well in most of the categories. So the, the little red dot line is the average of the Atlantic cities. Um, and one of the highlighted areas um, at the time of the survey that, um, that Fredericton was, did not score so well on was residential property. But um, with, uh, we, we know that specific door-to-door -door outreach is already planned for spring 2021. So that's an area that they have already improved. Um, and the results are basically an, uh, an auto evaluation from people in Fredericton uh, who work for the city. So, um, so basically they were able to say that they've already made improvements. So that's great to see. And at that point, I'm gonna hand over to Cheryl, who's going to now talk about that specific issue, the residential property protection. Thank you, Joanna. So if you can advance the slide, please. So my portion of the presentation is just gonna be looking at um, understanding household level flood risk and what can be done to understand the risks and to limit risks and to understand sort of the limits of uh, of risk reduction. So I wanted to just pull together some fast facts for people. Did you know that water suppress, surpassed fire as Canada's most common cause of insurance claims over 20 years ago? That's why insurance often says flood is the new fire. The majority of water claims are caused by leaking appliances and water pipes. And the remainder are split between sewer backups, sump pump failure, and overland flooding caused by heavy rainfall. 
So all Canadian homes are at risk of flooding for these risks that I just mentioned. And only roughly 5% of Canadian homes face additional risk due to overland flooding from rivers, lakes, and oceans. And that's due to the force exerted by moving water on walls and foundations of homes, damage caused by collision of debris in the moving water, and property erosion. Next, please. Okay, we also pulled in some facts, fast facts about home insurance because that is a really important part of our presentation and our, um, our work at the NTAC Center is to help people connect uh, an understanding of insurance and what they might need um, and to apply it at their homes. So did you know that water damage coverage for flooding caused by sudden and accidental leaks from plumbing and appliances is covered in all comprehensive homeowner policies? So it is widely available. And there is limited availability depending on the availability of optional coverages. Um, they may be purchased for sewer backup flooding, overland flooding, groundwater flooding or flooding from water and sewer lines. A lot of people just assume that all of that is included in their policy until they've discovered after an incident that it's not. So that's something to uh, certainly look into and speak to your, your, your um, insurance professional about. Something that's also important to note is that policies are designed to restore the former conditions of a house, not build back better. So one of the things that we encourage people to consider is working with their insurance providers. You can get one um, quote for building back exactly the same. You can get another quote for building back better and the insurance companies will pay the base and you can pay the difference so that you're actually better prepared for flooding the next time. So that's what we really encourage people to consider. And something else that we, we know that really impacts people is that claims on home insurance may be denied due to lack of regular maintenance and for leaving your home unattended for more than a few days. So we really encourage people to do their maintenance and to have someone check the home or have monitored um, uh, alarms uh, systems for uh, times that you're away for a long period of time. Next slide, please. Okay, so an overview of home flood protection. So overall, each home has a unique lot level risk based on its construction, condition, lot, the location, and whatever is in the house. Um, so you can, <coughs> excuse me, have two houses side by side that look exactly the same, but they can have different risks. Um, so you have to look at it in detail. And lot level risks, as Joanna was mentioning, they fit, of course, into a grander scale, looking at the, the basin level or the community level risks. And these risks include overland drainage systems, sewer systems, groundwater level, and how close the building is to rivers, lakes, and oceans. Protecting each home is unique based on its lot level, lot level and community level characteristics. So you have to do your homework and the other thing that we really want people to understand is that action taken to protect homes can reduce risk, but not guarantee that you will never have a flood again. Next, please. Okay, so Joanna was talking about lots of different flooding scenarios. Some people right by the river, some people inland, some people on the ocean. So when you start thinking about opportunities to reduce risk, there are a lot of uh, different, different things to consider and it's good not to just dive into um, a solution. It's good to, to do your homework and work with experts. So which approach you should be used um, really based on the type of flooding that you're dealing with, the severity of the risk and thinking about shorter and longer term risks. You might choose a really short term solution, say like using some sandbags right away, um, but longer term you might think about actually making some major uh, changes to your home. So the major concepts are de defending water, so defending your house, so keeping the water out by either dry flood proofing, which means keeping your house dry essentially, and using temporary barriers. 
If you want to adapt, the whole concept is that you will use wet flood proofing techniques. So you'll sort of go with the reality that water will come and go from time to time and you will design your building so that it can get wet underneath and then dry out quickly to minimize damage, use temporary barriers when needed and or elevate the building to facilitate the water to go in and out. The, <clears throat> the, the biggest, most costliest discussion that uh, Joanna alluded to was the whole making room for the river concept, which is talking about moving buildings out of the flood zone. So relocating a building, say to a higher elevation on your own property or to moving it off the property um, altogether and um, say having the government uh, take it over as parkland or something. Next, please. Okay, so now to drill down to what we're talking about today. As Joanna mentioned, there are a lot of different reasons why um, the risk of basement flood losses is, is on the rise. We've got links to uh, climate change. We've got aging infrastructure within municipalities. We've got um, loss of wetlands, forest. Um, so there's less storage capacity and recharge capacity of our local um, uh, land systems so that you get water more quickly going into uh, um, wherever it can flow uh, in the, the, according to gravity. And sometimes that means going into basements. And also homes uh, over time, even if they have <clears throat> well-designed home flood protection physical features, often there's a lack of maintenance. And so their uh, readiness to protect is, is decreased. And in all the grand scheme and all the different things that are going on, the only area that's really under control of homeowners to limit their flood risk is at the lot level. So that's what our center focuses on um, for the home flood protection program. Next, please. <clears throat> so the home flood protection program is a national flood risk reduction education program. The goals are to help residents take action to reduce home flood risk and reduce damage in the event of a flood. We can't always say that it's the water's not going to come in, but we can try to um, intentionally reduce what the water will be able to damage when it gets in. Our objectives are to develop and test a variety of flood risk assessment tools, third party outreach materials and stakeholder training programs and to achieve nationwide impacts by training professionals, home inspectors, insurance brokers, realtors, retailers, um, and of course, community volunteers um, to help support resident action to protect their homes from flooding. Next. So we looked at all the different options for keeping water, um, for reducing flood risk. And like we mentioned, the most common type of flooding is from heavy rainfall. And uh, so any risk, any home can be at risk from heavy rainfall um, in the country. So that's where we put our focus. And the method of protection that we chose is dry flood proofing. So that's to essentially keep the home dry. So the, the key principles are to keep the water out, remove it quickly if it gets in, and reduce risk of damage by selecting flood resistant storage options, furnishings and building materials. Next please. So this is where in terms of the graph, uh, the home flood protection sits on the defend um, line of this chart. Next please. So in terms of home flood protection assessments, this is where the on the ground research comes into play. We want us to know what was actually going on on the ground in Canada so that we could determine what are the practical ways that that we can help people. So we did a program pilot program in 2017-2018 uh, in southern Ontario and Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. We completed 510 assessments and tried trained 15 flood risk assessors. Our assessment protocols align with the CSA so a national guideline on flood protection and risk reduction. So the assessment tool that was used consists of a visual inspection, so similar to a home inspection, looked at physical features inside and outside, 
And it also involved a conversation with the homeowner and asked them about what maintenance practices they were doing, which is unusual for uh, a home inspection. So we wanted to really make it sort of an upgrade and an interactive process to ultimately have a problem, converse, problem solving conversation with residents and help them identify what solutions are best to help them. We provided a confidential report about top actions to reduce risk that they could consider where further investigation was required because a lot of, uh, in a lot of cases you do a visual inspection but you need to do further investigation like inside a, a sewer line for example you might need to have a a scope of the line just in case you're experiencing a lot of sewer backups and also links to practical resources. Next please. So the types of flooding that were assessed, uh, as I was mentioning up the top tier, we looked at overland flooding, so from heavy rainfall, storm and sanitary back, storm and sanitary sewer backup, groundwater infiltration and seepage, and we did not focus on those additional physical risks from moving water that are um, related to riverine and coastal flooding. Next, please. Okay, so we looked at a great variety of um, factors outside and inside. And when we boiled it all down, we saw a lot of commonalities. So the top flood risks that we physically recorded um, were, were quite common across the board and actually quite easy to address in a cost-effective manner. So the best practice to for your downspout discharge from your house is about two meters. We found that 78% of homes did not have a downspout long enough. We found that 69% um, of homes had foundations, um, sorry, grading. So the soil up against the foundation, the water was directed toward the foundation, increasing likelihood of infiltration. And also the sump pump discharge pipe was less than two meters away from the foundation. So what was happening was people's water would uh, be pumped out of the sump pump, discharged, and it would drain back into the foundation drain, go back into the sump pit and go back out again. So it was cycling, which of course leads to more burnt out pumps and flooding because of that. The top flood risk recorded inside the home, oh, next, back, okay, uh, were that there is no sump pump backup power, furniture and electronics were selected in say basement spaces that were at risk of water damage. 65% uh, of people had val some of their most valuable possessions just in say cardboard boxes right on the floor where they're at risk of water damage. And there is an obstruction to the floor drain in one out of three houses. So the, the drain in the, the basement would often have a box or a carpet right on top of it. And in terms of maintenance, we asked people to self-report maintenance. So we couldn't just physically uh, look to see if they've been doing maintenance. And um, so people tend, we know that pe people tend to be a little bit generous with themselves uh, with re reported data. So you can take it with a grain of salt. But even with that, we saw that 53% of people admitted they had never once maintained their back water valve, had never once um, tested their sump pump backup battery and never once tested or maintained their sump pump. So some of the key um, equipment that's in houses to protect people from flooding, they're not even testing it. And you got to remember back to the insurance coverage. If you're not showing that you're doing maintenance, then you can be at risk of not having insurance coverage. So that was something that really stood out to us. Next, please. So when we boiled everything down, um, we didn't want to just create a report that would sit on a shelf. We wanted to take these findings and frame them in a way that would be really helpful to people and help them address the top risks. So we created one line, um, essentially an infographic with the top line is top priority for people. Do simple maintenance of what you've already got can often be done for zero dollars and is not very technical. Number two is complete simple upgrades. So do it yourself for under $250. Go to the, the hardware store, um, you know, get a downspout extension for $10 or a, a sump pump extension for $10 and, and put those in place. Um, and then the other things were the in the final row to complete more serious 
more complex upgrades, if those simple things are not working for you, um, you should consider working with your a contractor, checking with your insurance company and municipality if there are any incentives or discounts, and also um, making sure that these are, are um, that if there are approvals required from the building department that you get those as well. So those are things like disconnecting your downspout from the foundation drain, um, doing major overhauls of grading of the property, installing a backwater valve, or installing a, a backup sump pump. Next, please. So from there, what we ended up doing was realizing that the in-depth assessments at homes with a home inspector that or home inspector, similar trained person, um, they were often costing right around $400. And even with the subsidy, they were maybe one to $200. So for most people, um, there, the financial barriers were significant. So what we wanted to do was create a free self-assessment app. So we did that and um, anyone can use it. It is confidential, it takes you five or 10 minutes to essentially go a through a series of yes or no questions. So I would really encourage anybody um, in, in your area to try it. And the nice thing about it is it will, um, not just ask you a series of questions that actually provides a confidential report that prioritizes actions in the maintenance, uh, low, co low cost, low tech, uh, and then the higher, um, higher tech, higher cost um, uh, category, and then provides really a great resource link. So I would encourage anybody to, uh, to look at that. And like we mentioned, this is not taking into consideration consideration additional physical risks posed by river or coastal flooding those are on top of these basic um, protocols next please so the other thing that we were starting to get a lot of questions about um, for even for homes that were not on a coast on a coast or beside a river was that there are certain neighborhoods in every community where they have chronic um, water in inundation, overland water inundation when there's a heavy rainfall. So people were asking us about temporary barriers. So we put together a list um, with, with um, some, some qualified professionals about some barriers, what they do and how they work and when they might be applied. So some of the barriers are just to, to block openings um, like a window or a door when there is uh, a flood coming. Some barriers are for a perimeter, so they go all the way around the property. They're installed generally ahead of a storm. So you have to know when it's coming and you have to have enough time to deploy it. Um, sometimes it can take minutes for click-in barriers like this, this gentleman who decided after repeated flooding of his basement that he had to take uh, more significant um, action and, and invest in some more um, tough barriers. Uh, it's on the, the river side in Edmonton, Alberta. That's just a pull down so it'll only take a couple minutes to install. Whereas uh, if you want a big perimeter barrier, it can take sometimes hours or days to install it. Next, please. Okay, so just one thing I want to encourage people to think about is to, to look at going beyond bags, sandbags. Sandbags are very commonly used, um, but it's good to think about where there are repeat incidents or it is likely that flooding will recur uh, on a regular basis. It's good to look at the pros and cons of something that's disposable like a sandbag versus um, reusable options. I won't go into depth about this slide because I know we're getting tight on time. And I wanted to note that the slides have quite a bit of detail and you can use them as a, as a resource. And we also have um, a resource sheet with all the links to this information and, and key uh, information links that will be helpful to you. So if we run out of time, that's okay. You've still got uh, lots of resources to take. Next, please. So the one thing that Joanna in particular really wanted me to mention is that it's great to have a short term option of these temporary barriers, but it is really important to work with a professional to uh, do design and uh, installs in many cases. 
And of course, once again, there's no guarantee that this will prevent all losses. Um, this is a, a photo that recently um, was part of a video coverage in the UK where um, a temporary barrier was in place and that's great, but unfortunately the water went higher than the barrier and breached. And so it the properties ended up flooding anyway. So the, the big point is um, work with a professional and know that these are not perfect solutions. Next. Okay, so as we were mentioning, key considerations for reducing risk uh, in higher, higher risk properties is you need to think about your short and long-term risks because as Joanna mentioned with climate change, many of these risks are changing, tend to be trending upward. Uh, of course, budget is a consideration. Insurance availability, are you gonna fix your house and then not have any insurance coverage uh, just in case? there is as an incident, um, are there government buyout options available that you should sort of put into your balance uh, of, of considerations? And with these higher risk properties, there are common requirements for consultation and approvals uh, with government officials and qualified professionals. And um, so it certainly gets uh, more complicated because frankly, the risk is higher. So, um, yeah, it's important to look at a variety of options, work with professionals and think short and long-term. Next. So these are not photos of the actual house, but I just wanted to sort of bring it back together to uh, the New Brunswick context and, and how the complexity of the decision-making process bore itself out on the ground in New Brunswick. So um, there is a couple named Keith and Roberta McKenzie who are kind enough to share their story with us. They're aged 80 and 83 respectively. Um, they have a house that's used as a bed and breakfast right beside the lower St. John River near, near Gagetown. Um, they experienced major river flood damage in 2008 where they had insurance coverage to help them uh, build back the same way to, to the dry flood proofing standard. Then in 2018, it hit again. They had no insurance. So they had to decide how they were going to pay for upgrades. And in 2019, uh, again, they were insured. So um, in terms of their solution, it changed over time. So they did a cleanup and repair of the original structure for 2008, 2018. In 2019, they actually raised the original four foot crawl space to an eight foot vented masonry blockage foundation with vent holes to allow the water to flow through. So remember we were talking about wet flood proofing, they decided to use that. So the pro of the uh, solution is that it's a longer term solution. They feel a great peace of mind that they, that they know if, uh, if the water is coming, that's fine, it's gonna flow in, it's gonna flow out. Um, the con is a big personal debt load. So um, it is complex and um, it's worth taking some time and, and working with a variety of professionals to come up with the best solution. Next, please. So Joanna, did you wanna just talk about some of these additional resources that you were able to find? Sure. Yeah, I just wanted to flick through um, some new Brun major New Brunswick resources. So um, the Conservation Council has a, a brochure that summarizes actually a lot of the in-tech centers guidance uh, in this really handy kind of two-page PDF, which I recommend that people, if they want a kind of a, a, a concise mini library of resources, that's a great resource. And uh, we, we're very happy that um, I, the, our advice was useful for that. Um, in addition, Fredericton, um, they had the um, community conversations on flood mitigation and resiliency in 2020. And based on that, they developed their resources to also help uh, homeowners in the city take action themselves. And they will be, these flyers will be delivered by the fire department for people um, at risk by staff in uh, this spring, kind of imminently. 
Um, and the, the two things that were raised in the community convocations was that New Brunswick needs stronger rules to protect watersheds and deforestation on land near waterways contributes to flooding and needs to be addressed. They were kind of points that were raised that I found interesting based on our previous uh, conversation about natural infrastructure. Um, other key resources, um, flood proofing, the government of New Brunswick has a pretty useful document on the different types of flood proofing that Cheryl has mentioned as well. And there's also uh, the Toronto Star produced a, a investigative report uh, which actually features some of the people on the call um, and their flood resilience stories, which I felt really brought home the kind of the personal side of, of flood risk. Um, so I recommend um, you can check that out if you haven't read it already. It's um, a fairly, uh, it brings it back to the personal level. Um, and then that is just a summary really of the key resources that the Intex Center has on our website. And if you need any additional information, Cheryl and I would be happy to receive your emails. And as Cheryl said, um, we also have a two page resource uh, sheet that basically summarizes all the links that we've um, mentioned in this presentation and that gives you kind of a takeaway so that you can go and follow up um, where you want to find out more.